were at a wedding, and um, how does John put it? Mary was invited. Mary, the mother, well, the mother of Jesus was there. Now, why was she there? And why would Jesus have been invited? Hmm. And why, more importantly, would Mary care that the wine ran out? Why would that be an issue to her? Well, there's only one reason. Well, there's two reasons, but the one is silly. That is, she hadn't had enough wine yet. <laughs> but the more serious reason, and it's going to be this kind of sermon, folks, it's going to be that kind of thing, um, is because she's, it's her family. This is a family wedding. So Mary has some level of responsibility for it. Running out of wine is a big, is a big faux pas in, in the ancient world wedding because the bridegroom is the one responsible for providing the wine. And so if the wine runs out before the party is over, that is an embarrassment. That is a disgrace. That is a sign that he cannot provide. That he is not a good provider. So this is a crisis. Hmm. Mary goes to Jesus. And Jesus does not say, all, all, all due respect to the New Living Translation, he does not say, dear woman. <laughs> he just says, woman. Now, now I'm going to tell you a story from when I was a young child that if I had ever stood up to my mother and said, woman, I would have been picked up later on off the floor because she would have decked me. <laughs> Calling your mother woman is an insult. That is disrespectful. Why? What's up with Jesus? Goodness gracious, what is going on in this story? Jesus, he says, what, what's, why, why do you bother me? This is not our problem. My hour has not yet come. We won't get into that. That's a whole got Bible study on John to figure that one out. Mary says, not to Jesus, she don't talk to him no more. She's done with him. To the servants, do what he tells you. Well, how does she know he can do anything? Hmm. Maybe he really has done something before to give her some knowledge that he can solve this problem by himself. And the thing is, <clears throat> the thing is, the way he solves the problem you know, fill those things with water, right? Which is not easy, by the way. They can't just turn on the faucet. You know, they got to get buckets and go haul in, you know, 180 gallons of water. Try to find 180 gallons of water in the Holy Land. It's not always an easy task. So that's a lot of work. All right, haul in the water. Nah, draw some out. How many of you ever seen a magic show? Yeah, I've seen magicians do that a hundred times. Take one lick, lick, turn it into something else. I have. I've seen it done. And magicians do this all the time. It's a magician's trick. Is that all we get? A magician's trick? Is that this is why the disciples believed in Jesus? Are you kidding me? This is all it takes? A parlor trick? And they're like, whoa, God. That's a low bar. If that's your threshold of Godhood, wow. You know, we make jokes about this miracle. We do. I'm not, we, we do. I mean, we've already been doing that, haven't we? Um, Jesus and his disciples go into a bar. And Jesus says to the bartender, ah, this water is for everybody. And he turns to the disciples and winks. <laughs> I saw a meme on Facebook yesterday. It's a, it was a communion, glass communion chalice filled with water. And next to it was a Jesus action figure. And the caption was, now we wait. <laughs> we mock this miracle. We make fun of it because we know it's so trivial. He turned water into wine? He didn't sing the Johnny Cash song. I thought he would. You know what? He turned the water into wine. Oh, my God. I stumped him. Oh, that's good. Oh, my God. I should quit now. Um, yeah, that's it. 
Is that really it? No, it's not, because this is the Gospel of John. And see, the Gospel of John, nothing is as it appears. The simple reading of John is never the only reading of John. There's always another meaning to what Jesus does in the Gospel of John. So there's another meaning to what Jesus has done at this wedding. And we need to seek that out to understand. Every miracle that Jesus does in the Gospel of John, there are seven of them has a deeper meaning. And that deeper meaning in general is to point us to God's kingdom and teach us something about God's kingdom and what life in God's kingdom is like. Every miracle does that. This one is no exception. Um, to get it, we're going to need to go back to the Old Testament for a minute. Weddings. The wedding feast. The great banquet. The great party was a sign of God's end-time victory. There's a passage in Isaiah that talks about how on God's holy mountain, God will prepare a feast of fine, well-aged wine and food rich with marrow. And on that mountain, the shadow of death will be taken away from all of God's people. And death will be no more. And God will win. And the proof of that is the best party you've ever been to. That's the wedding feast. So when Jesus is at a wedding, he's not just at a wedding, he's pointing us to God's victory feast. We're to get that image in our mind. And the main celebratory ingredient of God's victory feast is wine. The best wine ever. God's victory party will contain the best wine you've ever drank. And all of a sudden, you all want to go there, don't you? Yeah. So this is all of a sudden a complete teaching about God's kingdom. And the most important thing about God's kingdom that we learn from Jesus being at this wedding at Cana is how much wine there is. Six stone jars that each hold 30 gallons of water. And Jesus turns it all into wine. That's 180 gallons of wine. Mr. Simmons told me that's 900 bottles. He did the math. Because I didn't know at the early service how much that was. But think about it, 900 bottles, you know. Think about it, it's 180 gallons. So how many ounces are there in a gallon? 128. Because it's four quarts. 128 times 180? It's a lot of ounces of wine. Four ounces at a time? How long do you think that's going to last? A while, huh? And it's good wine. Because the thing you need to know about God's kingdom is abundance. Everything that happens in God's kingdom happens in abundance. God's grace is abundant. God's love is abundant. God's forgiveness is abundant. And not just a little bit abundant, but abundant beyond your wildest imaginations. Abundant beyond anything you can comprehend and anything you can imagine. Because it never ends. Because here's the thing about that miracle at Cana. If they drank all that 180 gallons of wine, what do you think Jesus would have done? Gone, sorry? I can do that again. And he would. Because it never ends. God's kingdom never runs out. God's abundance never runs out. God's grace never ends. And God's love knows no limits. And God's forgiveness is beyond all reconciling, all beyond all, all understanding. It is beyond everything we can comprehend. Because it is absolute, and it is unconditional, and it is eternal, and it is forever, and it is without limit. The abundance of God's kingdom is an eternal, unending abundance. And Jesus shows that to you by turning water into more wine than that party could ever handle. One more thing you need to know about John. For John, thank you for knocking my soda over. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not abundant. <laughs> um, 
thing about John is God's kingdom is not a future event. God's kingdom is not yet to come. Eternal life is not something that is yet to come in the Gospel of John. Eternal life is right now. You are already living in eternal life through Jesus Christ. You are already citizens of God's kingdom right now. God's kingdom is already present among you and within you right now. So the blessings of God, that abundant, overflowing love and grace of God is happening to you right now. You don't have to wait for it. You don't have to look for it down the road. As far as your other song, you don't have to imagine it. It's already here. It's already present. The party has already begun. The party is already happening. And you're in. You've been invited. You're on the guest list. You're welcome. Join in. Celebrate. Because the party's on. And it never ends. Because it's God's party. And it's the best party there ever will be. And that is why we celebrate. And that is why we praise the Lord. And that is why we dance and sing. You don't have to imagine it. You don't have to imagine what it would be like to stand in the presence of God, because you are. You don't have to imagine what it would be like to have God walking beside you, because God already is. I defy anybody to stand up and dance now, though. <laughs> I'm a lousy dancer, but at least I'm trying. <laughs> Lori should get up and dance. She's better than me. Marty, you could join her. <laughs> I guess not. It's too much. Anyway. Anyway. It's now. Now is the time to dance. And now is the time to fall on your knees. And now is the time to stand in awe. And now is the time to do anything you want in response to God. Because God is here. And the party is on. And the wine is being served. And the grace is being poured out. And the love is being shared. And it never ends. But this sermon just did. Yeah.